because you have to train the school. You got to train them how to deal with you. See, the school has trained you how to deal with it, but you haven't trained them on how to deal with you. So you take it home. And you tell them, I can't sign this now because I read everything thoroughly. I like to think about it thoroughly. And because white folks use technology a lot in written language, you got to let them know that it might be more than what meets the eye in this one sentence. So I got to take it home and meditate on it. And I got to discuss it with my child's father or with my child's mother. The quickest way to get the school to back off of you is to let them know I don't make decisions about my child unless I do it in concert with the other parent. Because in case you didn't know, I didn't create this baby on my own. And mothers, even if the father is not in the home, you act like he is. Once the school knows you're a single black mother, the way they deal with you transforms immediately. Yes, I have a husband, even if you don't. I'm married to my son's father, even if you're not. Well, while we haven't seen him, he's a 25-hour truck driver. He's driving right now on the road. And that's important because schools are extensions of the mass incarceration system. And as extensions of the mass incarceration system, teachers are the new police officers. And that means that anything you tell them, anything you say can and will be used against you and your child. So many black mothers go into the schools looking for sympathy, telling all your business, hoping that Miss Slurbanowski will show you some sympathy. <laughs> and so you tell Miss Slurbanowski all your business. Miss Slurbanowski, my oldest son's dad is locked up. My youngest child's father got married and moved to another state. I'm living with my mother, raising these three kids on my own. I just started a new job. Please stop calling me to come pick my son up early because if I keep on doing this, my employer says I might lose my job. You were looking for sympathy. But all you did was give Miss Slurbanowski and her principal, Mr. Silverstein, <laughs> the tools that they need to force you to either special educate your child or psychiatrically medicate your child. Now, Miss Slurbanowski is real slick, though, because after you cry tears, she's going to cry some back at you and make you think she actually gives a damn about you. It goes a little bit like, oh, my God. I had no idea it was that difficult for our parents. You mean you're raising three children alone without the father? You're my hero. And Miss Lerbanowski got you think she cheerleading for you. And the minute you walk out that school, she runs to the principal. And the next time they call you in and tell you we need this boy on 10 milligrams of Concerta or 10 milligrams of Ritalin or 10 milligrams of Vyvanse or 10 milligrams of Metadate and you say no, they're going to bring up that conversation when you said you're raising three children on your own living in your mother's basement. And the next thing you know, Child Protective Services is at your door. Is it true that all your children and you are cooped up in one room in your mother's house? Because that's against state regulations for acceptable square footage for a child to sleep. Now that's some shit. Because when our kids go to school, there ain't no square footage. They got 30, 40 of them squeezed up in one classroom. It's all right for them to do it in school, but it's a problem in your home. So stop sharing your business. They're not on your side. Rule number two, learn how to just say no to their requests for psychological evaluations. I need you all to understand 
that the learning disability is a professional opinion. It is not a scientific fact. I need you to know that ADHD is a working hypothesis. It is not an objective fact. Mild mental retardation is an opinion. It is not a fact. Yeah, some children might need a special education if they're deaf or blind. They might need a special education if they got moderate to severe autism, if they have a brain injury. They may need it if they are mildly to severely intellectually disabled. Nothing wrong with a child with a speech and language impairment getting some speech therapy. I'm not against that. There's 13 categories in special ed, but there's four of them that I got a problem with. The so-called learning disability, the so-called ADHD, the so-called emotional disturbance, and the so-called mild mental retardation. If your son's mental retardation is that mild, how do we know he has it at all? So parents, learn how to say no. Because special education hasn't saved a single black child in Milwaukee. I put my son in special ed so he can catch up. Well, let me ask you a question. When a child goes into special ed, the instruction and the curriculum gets dumbed down and slowed down. So if you put your child in special ed to catch up, I want to know how the hell that works. How can you ever catch up if the instruction is dumbed down? Special ed is the pipe in the school to prison pipeline. In October, I'll be doing a prison tour in South Carolina. And I wouldn't mind coming back to do a prison tour in Wisconsin. We could set that up. I don't charge for that. When it comes to the prisons and the juvenile detention centers, I don't charge for that. Some things need to be sacred within a black conscious struggle. Not everything should have a damn price tag on it. But when I go into the prisons, two out of every three, male, female, or juvenile, was in special ed. That's right. Two out of three had an IEP, incarceration education plan. IEP. 85% of special ed is for reading. Special ed can be reduced to reading problems. And why do so many black Milwaukee children have reading problems? Because 20 years ago, they made a switch in reading instruction from phonics based instruction to whole language instruction. Now, what's the difference? When I went to school, I'm 40 years old. So you guys who my age, I know that when we went to school, it was phonics. That means my fourth grade teacher, Miss Mack, would get up in front of the class and she would put one letter on the board, A. The whole damn day was A. <laughs> and she said, repeat after me. A, ah, uh, ah, uh, again. A, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Next day was the B. B, ba, ba. You got tired of it, didn't you? But she made sure you mastered the phonemes. You knew every sound that that one letter could make. And then after she did all of the alphabet, she came back and started combining them. Now it was A and B. F, up, up. Y'all remember that? And then it was A and C and A and D. She did this for every letter and for every letter pair. So even if you didn't want to learn how to read, you had to. But 20 years ago, white women said, that takes too much time. That is too much effort and too much energy. I'm not doing that. I'd rather go work out than do that then. So they came up with something called whole language. You know what whole language is? Building your child's sight word vocabulary. It is memory-based reading. Instead of teaching them how to sound out the word encyclopedia, we just want to put encyclopedia on the board and teach them how to memorize it when they see it. 
So when your child is reading a book, you think they can read well when the only reason why they can read that book is they're regurgitating words from long-term storage. Memory. Which is why I say every black parent is a homeschooling parent. Because you can't expect even a good, well-meaning teacher to give your child everything they need from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock. But the truth be told, Milwaukee, some of you are not homeschooling those babies after school. If I go in your house right now, how many of you got a dictionary waiting for them children? Right now is their thesaurus. Right now, a set of encyclopedia A through Z. I bet you you got cell phones in there, though. Xbox, iPad, big screen TV, cable. In fact, most of what you buy your child is nothing more than a distraction from academic improvement, which means every Christmas, every single Christmas, Black Milwaukee invests in the future incarceration of their children. This should be a quiet hour every night. And if your child don't know the answer to the question, you don't give it to them. You make them go find it. That's why the encyclopedia are, is there. Daddy, who was Harriet Tubman? Mommy, who was Malcolm X? Go look it up. Harriet, start with an H. Or are you one of those new Google parents? See, we got ghetto Google parents. Whenever the child need an answer, they just Google it on their phone. They got a book report due tomorrow, just Google it and change the name, baby. And they're going to be Googling their ass to prison 20 years from now. You keep playing around like that. Learn how to say no. And when you say no to the psychological evaluation or request for medication, do it in writing. One of our big problems is we like to deal with the European through speech. You cannot do that. Their whole culture is based on documentation of deceit. So you have to make sure you document the truth because they can have a thousand pages of lies. Your memory might be 100 percent accurate. But if it's not documented, it's as if it doesn't exist. It never happened. It never occurred. So you need to write a letter. Miss Slurbanowski. I am in receipt of your request for my son Jerome to get a psychoeducational evaluation by the Milwaukee Public School psychologist. I am hereby informing you that I am declining your request on the following grounds. It is true. Jerome is in the sixth grade and only reads on the third. That much is correct, Ms. Slurbanowski. But. What is incorrect is your assertion that it's due to a learning disabled. The reason Jerome is reading on the third as a sixth grader is because fifth grade last year, Miss Silverberg suspended my son five days every other week. He wasn't allowed in class long enough to learn how to read. The year before that, in fourth grade, okay, Mrs. Uh, Gold plate <laughs> got pregnant and had to go out on maternity leave in November. Jerome had 35 substitutes from Thanksgiving to the last day of school. And in third grade, Miss Crazyberg, fresh from the University of Wisconsin, first year teacher, didn't know how to teach, and I'm not sure if she could read her damn self. <laughs> so you see, Ms. Slurbanowski, we know why Jerome can't read. So you cannot put my child in special ed because according to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004, the current special ed law, a child cannot be placed in special ed for a learning disability if the problem is primarily the result of social economic disadvantage or instructional inferiority. <laughs> Deal with them in writing. Next, parents, you have a right 
to a second opinion whenever the school evaluates your child. Don't think that that report is binding upon you. It's not. If they say he's autistic and you don't think he is, you have a right to a second opinion. Miss Slavinowski, I am in receipt of your psychologist's evaluation about Jerome. It has indicated that Jerome may have mild mental retardation, also known as intellectual disability. I do not believe my son is retarded. I have a federal and state right to an independent educational evaluation by a school psychologist of my choice. Upon your acceptance of my request for the independent evaluation, I will provide you with the psychologist who will be completing my son's second evaluation. And the bill goes to the school district. You don't pay a penny. If your child is in special ed and they're not learning, federal law says you can make Milwaukee public schools pay for them to go to a private school. You just have to substantiate that special ed ain't working. So here we go with another letter. Miss Slermanowski. <laughs> Jerome has been in special ed since the first grade. He still can barely read and he's in the sixth. Federal law says my child has a right to a free and appropriate public education. Five years of special ed and still reading on the first grade level when you are not retarded does not sound like it's appropriate to me, Slurbanowski. So I am demanding an IEP meeting to discuss my son's placement because I no longer approve of Milwaukee Public Schools as an appropriate learning center for my child. Deal with them in writing. And speaking of children being evaluated too young, if your child is in the fourth grade or younger, especially the third grade or under, why the hell you let them get tested anyway? You don't let no six-year-old get psychologically evaluated. You don't let a seven-year-old get psych... Every seven-year-old in Milwaukee is ADHD. It's called being a damn child is what it's called. It's called being a normal child. Let's look at ADHD criteria. Loses things necessary to get his work done. Taps with his hands or feet. Acts like he's driven by a motor. Blurts out answers. Can't sit still. Has difficulty playing quietly. What child plays quietly? <laughs> Caucasian kids don't even play quietly. Any boy will meet that. ADHD is a fraud. It's regular boy behavior. The problem is that the schools are run by females. Public education is a female's industry. And when the boy cannot act like a girl, he's considered disordered. Boys have testosterone. Girls have estrogen. When girls go through puberty, they sleep all day. When boys go through puberty, they want to run all day. It has to be a different orientation. You can't expect a boy to sit still for six to seven hours. That's not his psychobiological orientation to his environment. ADHD. That ain't nothing but ain't no daddy at home disorder. He needs his daddy. He don't need the doctor or them damn drugs. He needs his daddy. See, the daddy brings the structure. Mom brings the love. Daddy sets the boundaries. Mom gives the support. Daddy keeps him in line. And mom makes sure he's strong enough to keep on striving. But when the daddy not there, now mommy got to do daddy's job, it gets a little tough. So the discipline falls a little bit. Not because she's not a good parent, but she should not have to assume a social role that is not consistent with her divine energy. 
And so the mother got to be the father and the boy can't really accept that. So he goes to school acting out because he misses his daddy. And we fail to realize that children don't talk out their problems. They act out their problems. So what you're really calling ADHD ain't nothing but an attraction disruption because Milwaukee police sent his father to jail. You want to fix Milwaukee schools? Give every black boy in it a strong black male teacher. It ain't hard to do, but you're not going to do that because the schools are mostly white women. And you are not going to disadvantage the privileged white female for the disadvantaged black boy. But I tell you what they will do. They'll go find a dozen or two black male teachers. But they won't be swagalicious. <laughs> They'll be fagalicious. I'm just being honest. They'll go and find the softest ass black male teacher that they can find. And they'll bring them in to teach the babies. They can see, you gotta understand something, Milwaukee. America hates, detests, abhors, and deplores the unapologetic masculine black male. He hates the masculine black male more than Ben Laden, Ben Robin, Ben Dayton, and Ben Stealing. He hates the alpha black male, which is why you don't see a lot of alpha black men anymore except in jail or on the corner. Because in order for black men to be successful in America today, they have to adopt a non-threatening disposition and demeanor. Look at your politicians, not all, but most. Look at your preachers, not all, but most. Look at your media personalities, not all, but most. Look at the black men in leadership, not all, but most. Have about 20 grams of sugar in their damn tank. It's sad, but it's the truth. I don't hate our LBGT brothers and sisters. I love them. They're still family. But I have a right to disagree with your behavior and lifestyle. The free expression of that spells extermination of the black family. And it's no other way to talk about it. It's no other way to talk about it. It's no other way to talk about it. Right now in America, only one out of every four black women will get married. Right now. You keep on exploding this homosexual agenda, it'll be one out of a hundred. I got two little girls. What the hell am I supposed to tell them when they're old enough to get married? That your brothers in the street would rather be with other men than be with you. God did not order the world that way. Study physics. For every positive charge, there's a negative to balance it out. For every yin, there's a yang. Everything exists in divine harmony. For the sun, there's the moon. For land, there's the water. For the man, there's the woman. When you put two negatives together, that can cause an explosion. When you put two positives together, that can cause a nuclear reaction. In order for electricity to circulate, the positive charge must be married to the negative. That's our spiritual foundation. And you don't let Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or anybody else come and tell you how black people supposed to run their damn families. Brother said, Dr. Umar, can I be a gay nationalist? Well, let's look at the word nationalism. The root word for nationalism is not, which is a derivative of nature, which means to procreate. So if you are in a same sex relationship where you cannot procreate, you cannot reinvent the African life. How can you be a nationalist when your relationship is against our nature? <laughs> Teach 
your own children of African history. In Philadelphia, we had a big movement. The scholars said, we're going to get black history in the school. And they did. One credit of that shit. And they said, Dr. Umar, we heard you were speaking against the movement to get black history in Philadelphia public schools. I'm not against that. But what I'm really for is us teaching our children ourselves. Why do we need white women to teach our kids where they come from? You got a church on every other corner and you begging white women to teach your children where they come from. And speaking of church. Deacon Watermelon, <laughs> Reverend Chicken Wing, and Pastor Porkchop. Still conning the hell out of black folks. $13 million every Sunday is what we give the church nationally. $13 million every Sunday, 52 weeks in a year, but black Milwaukee ain't got his own hospital yet. Black Milwaukee ain't got its own manufacturing plant yet. 13 million every Sunday nationally. Black Milwaukee ain't got its own import export business. What good is church if it's only going to help you prepare to die? We don't need institutions that get you ready to die. You're going to do that all by yourself. We need institutions that's going to help us live and thrive. That's what we need. And if your sole purpose is to prepare me for death, what the hell you need money for to do that? <laughs> All these mega churches. My problem with the mega church is how is it you floating a $50 million mortgage for a gigantic prayer house that employs not a single black person? The mortgage is a hundred million, but you don't put no money in no black people's pockets. But we're going to give a hundred million to the crack of banks. Are you serious? Not an after school job for a single child in Milwaukee, but you'll give the white man a hundred billion in the name of Jesus. And by the way, your ass ain't worshiping Jesus Christ anyway. You worshiping Jesus Cracker. And there's a difference between Jesus Christ and Jesus Cracker. So when you go to church tomorrow, let me know, is that Jesus Christ on the wall or Jesus Cracker on the goddamn wall? <laughs> Jesus Christ was blue, black, purple. Jesus Cracker is white. Jesus Christ got a nappy ass head. Jesus Cracker got a perm. And black people wonder why their prayers don't get answered when you're praying to Willie Lynch himself. And then you take your child to go worship at the feet of this Jesus cracker. And by the time they go to kindergarten, you're talking about the white kindergarten teacher taught your child how to hate themselves. Hell no. They didn't learn self-hate in public school. They learned it in Sunday school. Train a child in the way they should go, and when they grow up, they will never depart from it. It is you who taught your child to worship white folks. There's no way a child can see white God and then see the white police and not build a relationship. White God and see the white judge and not build a relationship. White God and see the white president, white governor, white mayor, and not build a relationship. If God is white and white people are in charge, maybe God put them there. And if you believe that God put the white man in charge, you'll never do nothing about it because you will believe your oppression was ordained by divinity. Any religion that tells you you got to die to go to heaven is a religion you don't need. I'll be damned if an imam, pastor, rabbi, whatever the hell y'all want to call yourself, I'll be damned if you're going to tell me I got to die to go to heaven when the white man got his right now and the Chinese got his right now and the Arab got his right now and the East Indians got his right now. 
So what's so divine about the others that they can have heaven on earth? And I got to have mine in death. And then your pastor take all your Jesus money and put it in a white bank. And that white bank will give your black people's Jesus money. And write loans to white folks to come into the inner city of Milwaukee and buy you out your own damn house with your own Jesus money. With your own Jesus money. Any black bank that's serious must have a credit union. Not a build a bigger church credit union, but a community development credit union. Because they're taking too much money not to be doing any job for you. Black people say we need our reparations for slavery. And we do. But let me explain something, family. All rehabilitation, all transformation comes from the inside out, not the outside in. So before there's any external reparation, there must be internal reparations first. Ain't nobody making you let your child watch Empire and Scandal. The white man don't make you make them kids watch that. Look at Scandal. Top miniseries on TV. Four major black actors. Lucius Lyon, Hakeem, Jamal, Andre. Look at the psychological analysis. Lucius, don't trust black women. Hates his baby mama cookie. Andre, bougie, snobby, uppity, elitist Negro, married to a white girl. Hakeem, hypersexual hip-hop head. He uses women for sex and he keeps on going. And then you have Jamal. Hey! In love with a white male. How can you have... Four black men in the number one miniseries on TV and not a single one got a positive relationship with a black queen in the whole show. <laughs> TV ain't entertainment. Television is political. You know better, but your 13 year old don't know better couple episodes of Empire, not a black girl in Milwaukee would want to marry a black man after watching that for three seasons. Couple seasons of looking at Cookie and Precious with that blonde wig on. No black boy would want a black woman after that. The hell they put that girl with a blonde wig on. Damn near scared me the other day. Turn the television off. Make them pick up the books and read them. Police been killing black folks like it's going out of style. We didn't seen it all, didn't we? Michael Brown and Trayvon, Eric, Sandra. And two weeks ago, you had your own situation here. Brother murdered by the police in Milwaukee said, we ain't going to let this one ride this time. And the bougie Negroes was mad at you. Negroes who act pro-black ran their ass as far as they could away from that burning car. Not me. It wasn't me, master. I was nowhere there. Shit got hot. No, master. I went home. Y'all really saw who was grassroots that night, didn't you? That's right. Them college-educated Negroes skedaddled their ass back to the suburbs. And then your mayor, what's his name? Tom Barrett. He said the Milwaukee revolt was fueled by social network. No, Mr. Barrett, it wasn't fueled by a social network. It was fueled by your trifling white ass and what you ain't been doing for black folks. It was fueled by unemployment. It was fueled by mass miseducation. It was fueled by mass incarceration, lack of access to quality health care, poor living conditions. You fueled that shit, Mr. Mayor. Don't blame it on Facebook. And then Hillary. And then Hillary and them say. And the DA. Now. Here's the ironic thing about the black revolts. 
after every revolt, Obama, Billary, <laughs> deplores the violence by black folks. This is not the way you bring about substantial change. You have to vote. But here's the only problem with that, President. When I studied the history of the United States, I learned that the United States was birthed by reaction to police brutality known as the Boston Massacre. Your country was born because citizens said, I had enough of this shit. But when black people's time comes around, it's not appropriate. Fighting against police brutality gave you the United States of America. But it ain't supposed to give us nothing. Revolt has its place. Yes, it does. Because it reminds the white man that every black person ain't scared of your ass. But here's the one piece we get wrong. When the brothers and sisters decide to go to the streets, the minute they go, you must be so organized that there's another contingency, a political wing whose job is to initiate negotiations with the power structure. And the revolt is not supposed to stop until concessions have been had. Not a single revolt yet included that. But I know why. Because we keep looking at bougie college educated Negroes to lead us to freedom. Listen, ain't no Negro with a Mercedes Benz, a $150,000 house, and a PhD leading your ass nowhere. Stop trying to get your leaders from the college-educated Milwaukee elite. Their minds have been poisoned against you. They may talk black, but they think white and they live green. The black bourgeoisie has been the biggest check on the progress of black folks since 1968. Some preachers, not all. Some politicians, not all. Some businessmen, not all. Some community leaders, not all. Some blacks in the media, but not all, who use their radio shows and TV shows and magazines and newspapers to do nothing else but distract you from your real issues. We ain't going to talk about the revolt. We're going to talk about Beyonce's concert. We ain't going to talk about the revolt. We're going to talk about who got robbed at the stop and go. We're going to talk about miseducation. We're going to talk about Hillary Clinton's upcoming campaign finance fundraising dinner. Some preachers who don't organize the congregation to fight racism while we alive, they just want to prepare you to die. Religion got a lot to do with this. Because religion has deified oppression to black folks. That's right. You go to church and the pastor say, don't worry about being broke. Don't worry about being broke at all. <laughs> Jesus had nothing but the cloth on his loin and his sandals. <laughs> yes, he make you feel good about being broke. Blessed are the poor. For only they shall inherit the earth. And then you start saying, oh shit, all right. I'm A camel will go through the eye of a needle before a rich man will enter heaven. Never mind my house and car, though. That's right. He evangelizes oppression. And if you've been taught all your life that money is the root of all evil, as soon as you get it, you try to get rid of it. And that's part of the reason black people like to the shopaholic they ass all day long. It's okay to be broke because after all, God don't like money. Well, guess what? Money is not the root of all evil. Not having no damn money is the root of all evil. 
When you go home tonight, your ass ain't ducking from Rich Blacks. You ducking from John John and them. God put you on earth to be abundant. God put you on earth to be plentiful. And don't you go trying to blame God because your ass ain't got the balls to stand up to white supremacy. Brothers and sisters, the reason the Chinese can come to Milwaukee and do better than you, and the reason the Arabs can come here and pop two gas stations, been in Milwaukee a week, he got five gas stations. <laughs> East Indians been in Milwaukee two months, they got three hotels. And you looking at yourself like, damn, why all the other minorities can come here and do so well? And we've been here for 500 years and we don't own nothing. You know why? Because the other minorities got access to capital. They got access to wealth. They get it at home or they have it waiting when they show up. They can go to Wells Fargo, Bank of Manhattan, Bank of America, Chase, downtown Milwaukee, and get a $2 billion business loan. That's right. That's right. Easy money. Popping up stores all in your ghetto. Only can't even speak English yet. No, sorry, we not sound. Huh? And you ain't got that because they systematically deny you access to wealth. Everybody knows you need wealth to build. That's right. The problem is our churches are not wealth building institutes. They are wealth draining institutions, which is why I believe the black church can no longer be the centerpiece of our community. It must be the black bank, the black credit union. Everyone in this room got to get so serious about black Milwaukee progress that you can put all your money in the same credit union and let it sit there and accrue that interest. And then we use the interest off of your deposit to build our own hospital, build our own homes, take care of our elders and our babies. That's how you do it. We need them banks and credit unions. Yeah, you could support black businesses, and we should. We're in one right now. But guess what? Even if the black business is doing well, if their money is in a white bank, the white bank makes more than the black business off the interest from the black business deposit. Yes. Which is why I tell the reparations people, I'm all for reparations, but we kind of put in the, cart before the horse but what do you mean dr umar i mean that if we got to pay out today we have no economic infrastructure whatsoever no institutional infrastructure so if every black person in milwaukee got a million dollars them all cadillac trucks louis bags Weed shops, medical marijuana plants. We'll be a million dollars richer tomorrow. In fact, you know what, Milwaukee? I'm going to keep it real, real with y'all. I think white folks and Chinese will fight harder than you for you to get reparations. Because the shit coming right back to them. That's right. See, I got some questions for the reparations people. Because I, I ain't got some answers on some. First of all, can I please see the lawyers? Who are the attorneys that we are trusting to settle our payment for that unreimbursed labor of our ancestors? Who are these people? Are these bourgeois lawyers? Or are these grassroots lawyers? Are these lawyers working pro bono and doing it because they love their people? Or do they get 40% of the damn payout? Oh, yeah. Because black people love talking that black stuff to get a check. That's right. Black, cap black consciousness is the new capitalism. Hell yeah. Get your ass to dashiki, run to Egypt, change your name, burn a pack of frankincense and zits. Get your ass a drum and a quarter pound of shea butter. In a veggie wrap and your ass is conscious. 
fake ass conscious black. And let me say this to the conscious brothers. You are not conscious. I don't give a damn how conscious you think you are if your queen ain't black. I'm so tired of you fake ass revolutionaries with white women, Chinese women, Arab women, Jewish women. You cannot be conscious and committed to the oppressor's daughter. I'm so tired of that shit. I got to explain that everywhere I go. I got an email yesterday when I was in Chicago. Brother said, brother, we got to talk about this, man. Because I love my people. Yes, my wife is white, but I married her 20 years ago. <laughs> Shit, Doc, can't you let me slide? No! <laughs> Get rid of her! I can't. We got kids. How old is the youngest? <laughs> He's 13. Well, five years, Underground Railroad her ass! It's sad. I had a black man tell me he couldn't come to my lecture because the white folks was allowed and his wife said he can't go unless she can go. I said, you are the softest nigga I met in my life. A white woman could tell your ass you can't go to a black conscious event. That's ridiculous. Black men, we got to commit ourselves to black women. We got to be unapologetic about it. They got to see it. Our sons got to see us loving up on black women. They got to see us respecting black women. They got to see us picking up black women. They got to see us fighting for black women. They got to see us dying for black women. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I didn't say she was perfect. You get on her nerves, she'll put your business in the street. If her birthday gift is too cheap, she'll sell your social at tax time. I know my sisters, but I love her anyway. I love the way she talk. I love the way she walk. I love the way she look. Nothing better than a black woman soon. She get her hair done and she put them jeans on. And she walked down the street with them professional glasses on, trying to act like she ain't think about you, but she flirting her ass off with that switch. I love black women. Butter almond, butter pecan, sweet brown sugar, chocolate cocoa, lemon. I like them skinny. I like them athletic. I like them petite. And I love them voluptuous. But you got the lover. You ever walk into the kitchen, brothers, and you open up the refrigerator, ain't nothing in there to eat? Your pockets is empty, just got laid off. You're like, damn, we can't even make nothing to eat in here. No canned goods, no sardines, no. That black woman will walk in that empty ass kitchen. And 30 minutes later, she will walk out with a gourmet meal from nothing. White women can't cook. They ain't got no seasoning in that damn food. I go to Europe on Tuesday. I go to Austria, Vienna. They invited me over there. I'll be in Europe for a week. You know what I hate the most about Europe? The damn cuisine. That shit nasty. Would you like some hors d'oeuvres? No, I would not. Cheese all thick, bread all cold, they food is nasty. And got the nerve talking about they the best chefs in the world. You got to go to Europe. What the? F <laughs> Black woman got that paprika, that jerk sauce. Make her own sauce. I made my own. God damn, I love her. So brothers and sisters, we got to find out who the lawyers are for reparations. We also got to find out whether or not the reparations movement has calculated the psychological costs. Did y'all hear that? I haven't heard any discussion on the psychological costs of slavery. I keep hearing about the unpaid labor. That's important. But what about the psychological restitution? 
Do you know you can get more from psychological damage than you could for the unpaid labor? But I'm not hearing no conversation. And then I'm also wondering why certain groups that participated in the Ma'afa have not been named. The Roman Catholic Church has not been named. How the hell are you going to fight for reparations or you don't talk about the Pope? No Arab countries have been named. They were in slavery before the white man. So you mean to tell me they get a pass? In fact, they still trading slaves right now in East, o East Africa. And then the reparations movement is divided. I just came from Jamaica Sunday. I was the keynote for the Garvey celebration in Ocho Rios. You know, CARICOM got their own reparation struggle. Black America got its own reparation struggle. Our brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom, London, they got their own reparation struggle. And then the brothers in Africa got their own reparation struggle. Do you realize that it was one slavery? It was just one. You got to unite all of them or the white man will play them off each other and we won't get nothing. And then my last question for the reparations people. What dollar amount you put down on that paper? Because it ain't one that's going to suffice. If it was up to me, there would be no money changing hands. We don't need no damn money. The white man's money ain't worth nothing anyway. I want wealth. I want assets. I want exclusive Control of land, resource, certain waterways. I don't want no damn cash payout. Well, what's wrong with getting cash payout, Dr. Umar? Shit, I got bills. Let me tell you why we should not settle for cash payout. The reason you should not settle for cash payout is because America, the white man's benefit from your ancestors' enslavement can never expire. He will always benefit from your ancestors in sleep. So if he give you a dollar amount, the money will expire at some date. So if his benefit from slavery never expires, my restitution should never expire either. Did y'all hear me? Just like when you guys put together that black grassroots Milwaukee Leadership Committee. That y'all need to put together to meet with the mayor and meet with the governor, meet with your state reps and U.S. reps and meet with your council persons and meet with the state secretary of education because y'all need to do that. Y'all yeah. revolt is still fresh. Y'all need to get that political wing organized so they can start negotiating with the power structure, letting them know that you need to get on this shit because that might pop up any moment again. <laughs> I don't want y'all to settle for no damn money because that's the first thing they're going to do, Milwaukee. Y'all going to come and sit down and they're going to say, hey, you guys are right. This shit is bad. <laughs> Here's what we came up with, guys. $50,000 in after school programs. Uh, we're going to do uh, $75,000 uh, uh, for some new homes, new project. Uh, we got another uh, $100,000 for small business loans. Better yet, Obama, I got a call from the president. Obama said he's going to give us a half a million for small business loans. And if the people you choose to negotiate away your oppression are thirsty, greedy ass Negroes. They're going to run with that damn petty ass grant money. You don't want no damn pocket change. What you want is lasting transformation. You need renewal through the city. Don't settle for no damn grant. They've been granting niggas cash for 50 years, and that's why we ain't got nowhere. The first thing they supposed to say when they come to that table, put the checkbook down. This ain't about money. This is about making a difference in the lives of our people. Keep your damn money. What we going to do about the school system? Keep your damn money. What we going to do about the prison system? Keep your damn money. What you going to do about black people's systematic access to wealth? That's what we want to talk about. You can't pay us the hell off. And I don't want no job from you either. That's the other thing. We heard you unemployed. Why don't you come and be the uh, mayor's representative on black youth issues? No, no, no. We just started a new hip hop grassroots coalition. And we put Miss Slurbanowski on the board. Stop letting white folks. Listen. 
When our children get murdered by the police, you know one of the things that hurts me a lot? And I don't knock the parents at all. My heart goes out to them. They lost their children. But it bothers me how quickly we settle for the payout. Y'all hearing me? The first thing the city does is what? Go meet with the family. Let them know we got a slush fund for killing blacks. I'm giving, this is what they do. We got a million dollars. And then they got some sellout ass lawyer all up in the family's ear. And the family settled. And you know, once you take the money, you have to sign an agreement that you can't talk about the case no more. I wish they stopped doing that. I'm waiting for the parent, and I hope we don't lose another child, but I'm waiting for the parent to say, I don't want no damn money. I don't want no money. I want transformation. I want transformation. Don't pay me off. This ain't just about Trayvon. This ain't just about Mike. This is about all black children in the United States. And it bothers me when they ran after Hillary Clinton and couldn't wait to endorse her. I'm seeing all the mothers of these murdered boys. I'm for Hillary. I'm for Hillary. But is Hillary for you? Have you asked that cracker woman for any type of campaign promise to give us a law that holds police accountable when they unjustifiably murder black children? Has Hillary said anything like that? Hell no. Spike Lee, I'm for Bernie. Montel Williams, I'm for Hillary. They ain't pledged a damn thing to black folks, and here y'all go running behind. You want to know who's going to be the next president of the United States? I'll tell you right now. And if I'm wrong, I owe you a million dollars. The next president of the United States will be global white supremacy. Well, Doc, we got to vote because our ancestors died for it. Excuse me. My ancestors didn't die for me to vote. They voted for freedom, and they thought that the vote equaled freedom. But here I am 50 years later, and I know a little bit better than what they knew back then. They died for freedom. They didn't die for voting. They thought voting was a means to the freedom. Why do black people do worse when black people are in office? Why do black people always do worse when black people are in elected office? You got a few exceptions. Harold Jackson and Maynard Jackson and you got a few exceptions. Adam Clayton Powell, you get a few. But you only get a few. And the reason they sell you out is because the average black politician is elected on white campaign contributions. Dr. Umar Johnson wants to be the mayor of Milwaukee. That brother's sharp. But there's only one problem. If I got to go to the Milwaukee Democratic Committee for some money to run, if I got to go to Walmart, if I got to go to the Chinese, if I got to go to the Arab gas station, I got to go to the East Indian hotels, I got to go to the Jewish-owned banks. By the time I get elected, my whole mouthpiece been bought. Did y'all hear that? I don't care how good of a person he is. If white folks is financing a campaign, they own them. That means that the black politician selling you out is partly your own fault. Because black Milwaukee should have a political campaign fund. So when you choose, don't let them choose you. When you choose the brother to be mayor or sister... You step to them and you say, listen, we want you to be the next mayor. We want you to get rid of Tom ass in there. How much is it going to cost you to beat him? Well, I heard that man been mayor since 2004 in Milwaukee. Is that true? Y'all don't got term limits here? It's 2016. God damn. What, he got three terms in? Is there a term limit in Milwaukee? Seriously. Does, so he could be mayor for the rest of his life. Damn, this shit is crucial. So listen, if he can be mayor forever, that man must be spending $5 million on his campaigns. That means we're going to have to spend five. If y'all really that serious about black freedom, y'all going to have to sacrifice your Christmas shopping and put that damn money in an account and find you somebody run against that damn cracker to get him on up out of office. That's how you win. That's how you win.
But you know what the problem is? Mayor Tom, I'm willing to bet Mayor Tom, because every white politician has this, Mayor Tom got a strong-ass black bourgeoisie support base. I don't even live here, and I'm willing. He got some house niggas who will dance for that man. He got some high for, I bet you he got some black churches in his pocket. Jesus Cracker, yes. And you know who the, the funniest group out of the bourgeoisie blacks is the status blacks. Because you got the religious bourgeoisie, the media bourgeoisie, the education bourgeoisie, the economic bourgeoisie. You got the status Negroes. The status Negroes is the Negroes in Milwaukee with titles. They got a handful of business cards. You say, how you doing, my brother? Pleased to meet you, Dr. Johnson. Welcome to the city. I just want to let you know my name is uh, Jerome Dashiki, and I am... I am the mayor's assistant vice under deputy recently appointed, not yet validated assistant to the third vice chancellor who's the undersecretary to the vice secretary for trash collection on Monday morning. Welcome to the city, my brother. And white folks put all these black people in position with these big titles. Why they do that? To make you think that they are empowering black folks. And then when you want to get something done in Milwaukee, you say, hold on, I got these business cards from that brother. Who was he again? I don't know. That shit was long. Vice. <laughs> so you call him and you say, hey, brother, we trying to get this community garden over here. The brothers and sisters in Milwaukee want to open up a community garden. You go to him. He say, I'm sorry, brother. That's out of my jurisdiction. But ain't you the senior assistant under vice? Not yet. <laughs> He said, nah, brother, you got to go to the mayor. You go to the mayor. Then the mayor got some Negro you got to deal with. Another Negro with a long title. We need that lot over there, my brother. I'm sorry, brother. That's not under me no more. That is actually under the managing director. Another nigga. You go to him. Can we get the lot? No, sir. That actually got transferred to the state like two months ago, brother. I really wish I could have helped you, but you got to go up to the state. You go up to the state. Nah, brother, you didn't heard Homeland Security took that lot over. How many of y'all been through this? Trying to make something happen in the hood, going through 20 Negroes, and not one of them with a title can help your black ass. This is white supremacy. And when you're talking about white supremacy, you got to know the rules of that shit. What are the rules of white supremacy? Because I need her to know the rules, and I need him to know the rules, and I need her to know the rules, and I need him to know the rules, and I need her to know the rules. And what's the first rule of white supremacy, princess? The first rule of white supremacy. The first rule of white supremacy. All white people are racist. <laughs> Every last one of them. All white people are racist. Did you hear me, baby? All white people are racist. The one you sleeping with, the one you're married to, your sister-in-law, your boss, your best friend. All white people are racist. Now, let me clarify, because we have some white visitors, and I want to make sure they get me correct. So let me clarify. No, it's okay. I'm glad they are here because they want to know who is this guy? He's never been on Oprah, but he's like a damn rock star. He's in rap videos and shit. Who is Umar? Who is Dr. Papa? So let me clarify. A white person does not have to hate a black person to be a racist. Hatred is personal. Hatred is a personal emotional reaction to another person for whatever reason. You do have some white people who hate us. But not all white people hate black people. Some white folks actually like you a lot. Yes, they actually like you. But their like for you has absolutely nothing to do with their obligation to their in-group to make sure Caucasians stay in charge. And that's what you got to understand. That's what you got to understand. They can play pool with you. Let's go golf. Let's go have sex. Let's make a baby. Fucking real. <laughs> but guess what? When it comes time to keep power concentrated in the hands of white folks, they all in board for that. That's why you never had a movement ever in world history. Nowhere on earth 
by white folks to remove their white privilege. They carry that card proud. That's right. That's right. And that's why black people get confused. Because you say, wait a minute. My best friend is Sally. Me and Sally went to school together. We got married together. My mom or her mom, we live next door to each other. We went to college together. We got a job together. And then I found out that a certain managerial position was available when Sally knew about it. And she didn't tell me. And instead, went and told a white person she didn't even know. And the white person got the job. And now I'm all confused because I know Sally cares about me. But why did she give a job that was meant for me to a white person when I'm her friend? Because you fail to realize that friendship is personal. White supremacy is business. And that's why y'all don't get it. It's a business. In fact, call it White Supremacy Incorporated. That's right, black man. You gave that white girl five babies and she's still a white supremacist. Let her get a phone call by her people saying, listen, we need you to entrap that fake ass nationalist up there in Milwaukee who gave you all them babies, she would be right there to do it. She would be honored <laughs> to prove her loyalty to her people. Tiger Woods' ex-wife was honored. Tim Duncan's ex-wife, honored. O.J. Simpson's ex-in-law, they were honored to destroy him. That's the first rule of white supremacy. They all racist. And because I know they racist, me and white folks can have a good conversation. They call me up, but hey, Doc, you want to do lunch, man? I got some questions. <laughs> they be shocked and shit. Like, this dude got a doctorate just telling us that we ain't shit. <laughs> but I don't disrespect white folks. They, I respect them. They respect me. But at the end of the day, I'm unapologetically African, and he unapologetically Caucasian. And to be honest, he can deal with me more than he can deal with you. You know why? Because you want to marry his daughter. I don't want her ass. You want to live next door to him. I don't want to. That's right. You want to integrate. White man can't stand the integration of this nigga. And why do white folks hate integration? Oh, God, they hate integration. Lord, have mercy. Don't talk about that. You know why? Because you fail to understand why integration was even birthed. While white supremacy was even conceived, while eugenics was even created, it all comes down to fear of a black planet. See, segregation in Milwaukee back in the 60s wasn't about power, it wasn't about money, it wasn't about influence, it was about keeping the black man's phallus out of the white woman's vagina. Segregation is about keeping that out of this. And why? Why is the black man so despised and hated? You ain't got no job. You got two felonies. You've been in special ed your whole life. 20 <laughs> bottles of Ritalin pills. And the black man walks into a room with a rich white man. You got a rich Italian, rich Chinese. You got the Jewish banker, Arab gas stations, East Indian. And you got a broke ass black man walk into the room and they all hate his ass. Why do they still hate you, black man, even when you ain't got nothing? Because you're the only one in that room who can reproduce himself in the women of anyone else in that room. Not one of them can make himself through you, but you can make yourself through him. You are God, and he knows it. Oh, he knows it. Black people say, why white folks still hate us, y'all? Why they still hate us? Three reasons. I just gave you the most important one. Genetic dominance. You're the most genetically dominant people on earth. It don't matter who you reproduce with, you make yourself. The white man with all his money and tanks and bombs cannot make himself in anyone else's woman.
And all this time, you thought the white man was jealous because of your reproductive size. That has nothing to do with it. Because some of your asses ain't blessed in here. It's about genetic dominance, not size, but potency. That's why in America, they used to hang Irish. They used to hang Jews. They used to hang Italians from trees. You know that? Because they wasn't considered white folks until the 40s. But they never castrated the Italians. They never castrated the Jews. They never castrated the Italians, but they always castrated black men because you're the only one who posed a genetic threat. See, the white man to talk about the nuclear threat. He'll talk about this threat and that threat. But you never hear him talking about openly genetic threat. And for all my Hillary Clinton lovers, she is a big time population control junkie. Hillary Clinton, you're going to get more black abortions, more black hysterectomies, and you black women better watch them abortions because now they're fixing you up when they abort so you don't conceive anymore. Too many black women are not able to get pregnant again after having an abortion. You got the highest rate of abortion malfunction, if that shit is a word or not. That's why they got the gay movement. The gay movement is population control. What Kelly say a minute ago, she said, they said teenage pregnancy is down in Milwaukee. I guess so. When you got all the kids interested in each other. And that's the purpose of the homosexual movement. It ain't about family. It ain't about freedom. It ain't about civil rights. It's about cutting your damn numbers in half. Because America don't need the black men and women no more. They don't need you no more. They got Mexicans in here to do all them jobs. Oh, hell yeah. Why you think they letting all the Mexicans come in to replace you? Because you cannot kill a people if you are economically dependent on their labor. So the first thing you do if you're going to exterminate a people, you must make them useless to the economic order. This ain't the first time. They did it in 1865. Right after the end of slavery, the first thing they did was brought in three million Chinese and Mexicans to come and work the railroads. What the hell you need Chinese and Mexicans to work the railroads for when you got four million recently freed African slaves? Because you do not want to give their ass a job because you don't plan on keeping them around that long. This is the reality. And they telling you, you can fix it all by sending your child to college. Just send them to college. What the hell college been doing for black Milwaukee except putting your ass in debt to the banks of Wisconsin? Raise your hand if you got a student loan. Look at all these damn student loans in here. Look at all these damn student loans in here. And you can't wait to send your child to college. I need some water. Make sure the cap ain't popped. Because y'all will not do that Johnny Cochran shit to me. Y'all poison Khalid Abdul Muhammad, you're not going to poison me. Steve Coakley. Hell, Steve said, if I ever go to the hospital, I know I ain't coming out. You know, that's why revolutionaries don't use their real name when they go to the hospital. And I suggest you do the same thing. Any of you brothers active in the community? Mayor Tom, know who you are? Don't you use your name when you check into the emergency room. Your ass to go in there for a mosquito bite and come out with your head off. You better watch this. I'm serious. Talk to the brothers in New York City. They'll tell you you go into the emergency room. They put your name in a computer that's linked to the police. Y'all remember Mayor Chukwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi? Our revolutionary brother who became mayor in the capital state of Mississippi. He went into the hospital with chest pains, walked into the hospital on his own free will. He's the first person to bring me to Mississippi. Next thing you know, they called him and said he's dead. How the hell this man dead? Walked in with a three-piece suit on on his own volition, dead in a few hours. That's why when I go to the hospital, I got a couple names. My first name, I'm Jesus Christ. Excuse me, sir. Jesus fucking Christ. That's right. That's right. I don't use my real name. Dr. Savy was murdered. Dr. Savy was murdered. 
And isn't it interesting that he gets killed in the same country of Mexico as Malcolm X's grandson? Under the same circumstances, transporting a large sum of cash. I got two, I got three, seri- three theories on the Sabi murder. Rest in peace. One, black people were involved. I, I have to entertain that. I'm not saying they were, but I study black assassination. And normally, a nigga was involved. And I'm ha- finding it hard to understand how this man was in jail for weeks. And nobody told us that shit. In the hospital for days. And nobody told us. We could have went down there, did a protest, had an international outcry about it. But nobody told us. There might be a reason for that. So we're not incriminating because we don't have all the facts. But that is some very suspicious shit. I'm telling y'all right now. When I go to South Africa next month for that month long tour and my ass get locked up and you don't hear about it, blame the people who brought my ass. Because ain't no way in hell I ain't making a phone call to let somebody know I'm in here. You need to spread the word. Number two, the cops killed him for the money he had. They said he had thirty thousand dollars. You multiply that by Mexican money. That's a nice chunk of change. They took the money and murdered him so he couldn't tell what actually happened. And number three, which is probably the most likely reason. The Food and Drug Administration conspired with the police force of Mexico to murder Dr. Sabin. Because you know the day after they murdered him, we found a cure for AIDS. White man, I give the white man credit for one thing. He has been consistent for 500 years. He ain't changed yet. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. Now, because I have ADHD and you took me off my focus, what was I talking about before you asked me about Dr. Sabin? <laughs> Genetic, okay. The two other reasons, I got ADHD, but my daddy was home. I couldn't get, and he was a drill instructor for the Marine Corps. So I could never come home and tell my daddy, I cursed the teacher out. I think I need some drugs. <laughs> White people can't stand you because of your historical achievements. You built the greatest civilizations on earth, and they know that if you did it before, you can do it again. And the third reason that they can't stand your ass, besides your genetic dominance and your historical achievement, is your intellectual potential. Has anybody watched the Olympics down in Rio? Usain Bolt winning all the golds. I was in Jamaica at the time. I didn't know Usain Bolt and I share the same Earth Day, August 21st, by the way. Did you see the sister win gold in the shot put? Oh, yeah. With her big, sexy ass. Did you see the sister win gold in the swimming? She couldn't even believe she won. She got to the end of the joint, looked around. Oh, shit, I got and did you see the young gymnast? What is she, 16, 17? The white man on international TV, I know they're going to get his ass. He said, she's not only the best right now, she's the greatest of all time. White folks know what you can do. They let Tiger Woods in golf and look what his ass didn't do. And they still ain't over Serena. Neither am I. Stop it! Good God Almighty. Jesus Christ. I know there's a Lord somewhere. But every time they let you in some shit that's supposed to be white, the cream rises straight to the top. So white folks is like, wait. These people built the pyramids. Every time we let them in any sport, they take it over in five years. And then on top of that, they invented 85% of the shit we use. And they invented it before they could go to school with our kids. 
These people came up with the helicopter, the internet, the cell phone, the refrigerator, the walkie-talkie, gas mask, stoplight, and everything. Listen, let me give you the hypocrisy of white supremacy. If you are supreme to another people, you do not have to, in any way, shape, or form, disadvantage the competition. If you are naturally superior, you do not have to manipulate my failure. And if you have to manipulate my failure, by contraindication, you're actually proving who's really supreme. Before I wrap up Milwaukee, can I talk about Jim Crow for a minute? Willie Lynch. Slave master came to North America to teach other slave masters how to rule their slaves. Now, some people debate whether or not Willie Lynch actually existed. He may have, he may have not, it does not matter. But as a student of intellectual science, I know that the Willie Lynch letter is scientifically accurate. Now, Willie Lynch told the slave masters to do a lot of different things in Milwaukee, but I just want to give you three. The first thing Willie Lynch said was never let your slaves communicate in their native tongue. You must break the tongue and give them your tongue. But the slave masters of America did not listen. No, they did not. It was against the law for you to learn how to read. If they catch you with a book, they would literally cut your fingers off. That was the official punishment in some of the 13 colonies. You could get your back whipped, bare blooded and, and bled skin if they catch you trying to learn how to count. They didn't listen to Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch said if you let them keep their tongue, they will never forget that they were a people before they found you. Which is why, by not letting you learn English, the white men helped preserve your African tongue. Which is why today in Milwaukee, every last one of you in this room, none of you speak standard English. PhD, masters, doctorate, none of you speak standard English. You speak an African form of Niger-Congo dialect. The only thing you borrow from your slave master is his vocabulary words. Now let me illustrate this. Because some of the bourgeois niggas is like, I don't believe he just told these people this. Let me give you three differences between European language and African language. Difference number one, many white words end with a lot of consonant sounds. European language is intoxicated with consonants at the end of the words. White people talk like, we are getting ready to go have supper. With Miss Slurbinowski. <laughs> when you study West African language, many of the words end in vowels. So the words tend to blend with each other because they are rhythmically connected. So in Milwaukee, you don't say we're getting ready to go have dinner. You say we fixing to get something to eat. It's all one word. It flows and rhymes like black folk because we are rhythmic as people. <laughs> Difference number two. When white people talk, they value transmission of the intellectual idea. So white people will ask you after speaking, did you understand what I said? Did this make sense? Did you comprehend my message? They focus on the message. That's not black. African people focus on the message, but we focus more on the energy with which the message was sent. We focus on the vibration because the vibration tells me what your ass really meant. Let me give you an example. Sister comes to work with some ugly ass high heels on. And your co worker says, Girl, them shoes is nice. Did you hear what I said? I heard what you said.
but I know what your ass meant. That they ugly as hell, and I know that. Brother, you be with your queen, and she fine. And another brother comes and say, hey, brother, I just want to compliment you. Your wife is beautiful, brother. Did you hear me, brother? I heard your ass. But what I felt is your ass is thirsty for my queen. So put your damn tongue back in your mouth and keep it stepping. See, black people, we are all about energy. That's why we can walk into a room and we know who don't like us within five minutes. Because they will send that energy shit right at you. Boom! And the last difference that I will talk about between white language and black language is white people believe that only one person should talk at a time. (laughs) Miss Slurbanowski said, once I'm done, then you can talk. And you got to listen to her for 15 minutes. Lie on your damn son. And white people consider it to be disrespectful to jump in while someone else is talking. Well, that's not African. See, this structure of their culture is like this. It's vertical. The structure of our culture is like this. It's horizontal. White people value titles. I'm the president. I'm the queen. I'm the king. I'm the duke. See, you even get on an airplane They got to segregate the airplane. This is first class. This is comfort. And this is the hood. Because they believe in hierarchy. You are valued not because you exist, but for what you can do for me. Black people, we value everybody. Everyone is equal no matter who. So if I'm talking and my brother wants to jump in and finish my message, We accept that as the participatory communication culture that we have. So a brother coming home from work, he at the bus stop, it's another brother. He don't even know the brother. And he say, brother, I know you don't know me. Can I talk to you for a minute? I got something on my mind. He said, yeah, brother. I said, you know what? I was at work today and he jumped right in. Wait a minute, brother. Them damn crackers got on your nerves today. (laughs) Do you feel me? See, black people, we about feeling. And if I'm communicating a message and you feel me and you jump in on my message, that validates me. But most importantly, it lets us know that we all in oneness. And then Willie Lynch said, if you want to control black people in Milwaukee, you got to introduce petty differences into the community. You need the Muslims fighting with the Christians. You need the Garveyites fighting with the Nation of Islam. You need the socialists beefing with the Nawapians. That's right. You need the vegetarians fighting the meat eaters. Them vegetarians is crazy. They be harassing me. I get 10 vegetarian harassment emails a week. Brother, you are the top speaker right now, and you are not sending a good message by eating that flesh. (laughs) They be at the airport. Listen, brother, we done made your whole meal for the three days you're going to be here. No flesh. (laughs) But you know what? They finally got to me a little bit. Because January 1st of 2016, the beginning of this year that we're in, I stopped eating all meat except fish. So they got me a little. They harassed my ass so much. They done brought me so many green smoothies backstage that I had to submit. And when we open up the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, We're going to be 80%, 80%, I said 80%, raw and vegan. We can't be 100 because I would be a hypocrite to stand here and say 
that I think I can go the rest of my damn life without a Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> so I'm not going to lie to you up in here. Okay? I'm just going to keep it gangster. But we got to get over our petty differences, y'all. Fighting over light skin, dark skin. What kind of stuff is that? We all one people. Educated, not educated. Suburbs in the hood. Milwaukee versus Green Bay. What the hell is going on? We got to unite. Get over the pettiness. And the third thing Willie Lynn said is you got to put the women against the men. He said, line up all your Negro slave women and all your Negro slave children, especially the boys. Find you the biggest, meanest alpha male, the most testosteronic buck in your bunch. Bring him out in front of those black women and children and beat him to within an inch of his life. Don't kill him, but beat him so bad he will wish he was dead. Make sure the women watch. Make sure the children watch. Tar and feather that Negro and then pick him up and tie one leg to one horse facing east and the other leg to another horse facing west and beat both horses simultaneously in front of the women and children until they run and split that Negro's body in two. He said, if you emasculate the male in front of his woman, where she once respected him, she will now despise him. When she once looked to him for protection, she will now start protecting him. Where she once relied on him to be a provider, she will become the provider herself. In fact, if she gets so frustrated for the fact that her males cannot become men, she might just decide to become a man herself. Black women. Brothers in trouble, black women, you're right. Some of those issues we got to fix. Some of those issues are structural. You got to know the difference. And no matter how upset you might be with us as black men, and I apologize to every sister in here for any hell you went through because of us. But don't you ever let the white woman in her feminist ass movement draft you and use you as a weapon against black men. How the hell you a feminist? I'm a black feminist. Do you know anything about the origin of feminism? Did the white feminists do anything when your ass was in slavery? In fact, on the slave plantation, who was the black woman's biggest problem? The white female. Who made the slave master sell your children a thousand miles away to prove that he didn't care for them? The white female. Who made the slave master whip you almost until you were dead? Because she was jealous that her husband would rather have sex with his slave than sex with his wife. And you mean to tell me 150 years after slavery, you got the audacity to unite against the white woman against me? Don't you understand that you and I share the same plight and our enemy is one and that enemy is white supremacy, not each other. I had to tell the homosexuals that. I said, don't come at me with no LBGT movement. We not fighting for the right to have sex. The black man ain't fighting for the right to be another man's man. The black man is fighting for the right to be a man to his woman. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we got work to do. For announcements. Announcement number one. I was blessed enough by the Most High and the ancestors to host my first unapologetically African black college and consciousness tour this past July. We're going to be doing it again next July. If you have a son or daughter between the age of 11 and 17, boys and girls, 11 through 17. And yes, you can send the gay ones too because we can fix all that. 11 to 17. 
The first two weeks in July of 2017 will be the Black College and Consciousness Tour. The first year, which is this past summer, we took them to the Audubon Ballroom where Brother Malcolm was murdered. We took them to the Apollo Theater. We took them to Ferncliff Cemetery where we pull libations at the grave of Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakin and Paul Robeson, and James Baldwin, Khaled Abdul Muhammad, Malcolm X, Betty Shabazz. And then we took them to Delaware State University and University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Cheney and Lincoln, our two oldest black colleges. I took them on a Liberty Bell tour on the 4th of July because I wanted them to see the hypocrisy of a country that claims to believe in freedom while enslaving millions of Africans. We took them to the Black African Holocaust Museum in Philadelphia, the only one in the country. On July 4th, they went. And then we took them to the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore, Morgan State University, Coppin State University, Bowie State University, Howard University. We took them to the Benjamin Banneker House and Museum. We took them up to Troy, New York, to the Harriet Tubman Grave and Museum, the Frederick Douglass Home. We took them to Great Adventures, Dorney Park. We took them to play paintball. We had a lot of fun. We went to the movies. And then we took them to the Nat Turner Trail in Virginia. And they relived the whole war trail of Nat Turner. Let me tell you how opportunistic white folks is. Not the white folks in here today, but the ones outside. <laughs> they found a house. They found one of the houses where Nat Turner went in to kill the white people. And the white folks found the house and they uprooted it. We saw this. And now they're about to build a little Nat Turner Museum. <laughs> White folks is going to build a Nat Turner Museum. What? On this one house where some of Nat Turner soldiers murdered some White folks. Because it's the only one that they can prove was actually a part of the revolution. Oh, they're doing the same thing with Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman been dead since 1913. Over 100 years. And guess what we saw when we went to Harriet Tubman hometown of Bucktown, Maryland? They're now building a state of the art right now. Harriet Tubman National Museum in Bucktown, Maryland. It opens in October of this year, I think. They didn't give a damn about no Harriet Tubman. But guess what? Guess how much money they're going to make with that damn? Guess how much money they're going to make off that Nat Turner Museum? White folks don't like your history, but they'll damn sure make a buck off of it. Somebody said, what do you think about Harriet Tubman being on the back of the $20 bill? Uh-uh, she only on one side. Guess who on the other side? So Harriet is on the front. And guess who on the back? Racist ass Andrew Jackson is on the back of the Harriet Tubman $20 bill. What kind of shit is that? Let me get this right. You will put Harriet on your money. But when Harriet retired from the Civil War, y'all refused to give her a pension. Harriet couldn't get a penny from the U.S. government. But 106 years after her death, y'all want to honor her by putting her money. It ain't about that. It's called the illusion of inclusion. Making you think that we care about your ass while we planning your extermination. You and I know that if Harriet Tubman was alive today, she would say, keep your damn money. I remember when Susan B. Anthony invited Harriet Tubman to go to uh, hear Abraham Lincoln read the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. She said, Harriet, President Lincoln's in town. We should go. He's reading the Emancipation Proclamation. Harriet Tubman said, I beg your pardon, you cracker. She said, my family is in Maryland. The Emancipation did not free any slaves in Maryland. Delaware, Missouri, or Kentucky. So I'm not going to hear your president read that because it don't apply to mine. Harriet was bad. That woman was bad. Even before Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey, she's my number one. That little old black lady all by herself working in the night like that with a smile on her face. What'd she say? She said, I knew I had a right to one or two things, liberty or death. 
if I could not have the one, I knew I would get the other. They said Queen Mother Harriet took a rifle with her every trip she made down south. Because she had to pop some niggas. She said, listen, once we start, ain't no turning back shit in here. I will bust a cap in your cell house. And guess what? Nobody never turned back. Because they knew Harry would have to take their life. Not because she wanted to, but they would have snitched out the whole route. You know black people love to tell white folks what the hell we doing. But what I love most about Harriet is when she said, I freed hundreds of slaves. Could have freed thousands. Problem was, they didn't even know they were slaves. So guess what, brothers and sisters? Next year, the college tour is going to be focused on the southeast. So we're going to hit up Clark, Morehouse, Spelman, Tennessee State, Fisk, Tuskegee Institute, Lamone Owen College, and all the other HBCUs down in that neck of the woods. We're going to go to the Dr. King Home and Museum, Charleston, South Carolina, Slave Trail, the Civil War Boat Tour, the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, which is the hotel where Dr. King was murdered, the George Washington Carver Museum. I'm looking forward to it. It's 14 days. In 14 nights, the cost of the trip is 3500 but I pay 1500 You pay the other two. Everything is included. All they need is some spending money for great adventures and for the gift shops at the different museums so they can buy a little something. What I notice is the kids like to buy a sweater from every college we visit. So make sure they got enough money to buy a sweater or a T-shirt from the different colleges that we visit. My students loved it. They still calling me now. Dr. Umar, is the, ready, is the next trip ready? Even the parents is calling me too because, you know, them two weeks is. <laughs> I ain't mad at you. But again, y'all, we only going to take one bus load. I can't let it get too big because the children got to experience me. Okay? I'm not being vain, but I'm part of the experience. Because at the hotel, after we done, guess what? We in a hotel conference center. And I'm drilling them, understanding white supremacy, how it operates and how to navigate it, starting your own business, African history and culture, why you need to do well in school, why you need to respect your parents, living as a black child without your father in your life. So every night we hitting them with a different subject matter. And on the bus, when we driving from state to state, guess what they watching? Nothing but black videos. Shaka Zulu, <laughs> Tuskegee Air, Khalid Muhammad. Damn! One mom called me. She said, "What did you do to my son? He's a little Umar." So mothers, be careful now. You send your sons with me, they're gonna come back home and say, "Woman, take that perm off your damn head." Also, brothers and sisters. And I heard Sister Cheryl talking about it backstage. Milwaukee was one of the first National Independent Black Parent Association chapters that we started. Yep. Well, guess what? We gave official launch to the organization in Baltimore, May 27th to the 29th, a few months ago. That was our first training. Our second training is in Houston, Texas, in two weeks. Friday and Saturday, September 9th and 10th. I'm hoping that some of you who want to be part of that chapter, come and get the mandatory training because you have to have it in order to operate or be a leader within the chapter. It's two days, September 9th and 10th. You can register for it right now on my Eventbrite page, princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. September 9th and 10th, you got to come and get the training. See how we operate. We're going to teach you how to advocate for parents, how to organize the chapter. The do's and don'ts, understanding the law. Two days. Come on out. And you might even stay over to Sunday morning. The parent conference is Friday and Saturday, but the next day, Sunday, at the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Houston, I'm going to be hosting my first 
for sisters only relationships and dating breakfast. Hey, can't be no kids in there. All right. So think about coming, y'all, because the Parent Association is the first national black parent group ever started in America to bring justice to our children by empowering our parents. Seven committees, a special ed committee to investigate special ed fraud. How many black kids in special ed in Milwaukee? Are they in special ed for retardation? Are they in special ed for autism? Are they in special ed for speech and language? Are they in special ed for the math disability? And what are the principals doing with your child's special ed money? Because you know special ed kids are worth twice the dollar, right? Special ed is a business. The only reason why they put your kid in special ed is to get paid. And then we need a school discipline committee. How many black kids were suspended from school in Milwaukee last year? How many were expelled from school in Milwaukee last year? How many were sent from the teacher's classroom to the principal's office and you never even knew about it? And then we need a policy committee to change the rules in the schools that work against our children. Your son go to school on the east side of Milwaukee, but you want him to go to that school over there on the west side of Milwaukee. But the principal said he can't grant the transfer because they have a policy in Milwaukee that kids got to go to school in their neighborhood. Is that a state law? Hell no. It's a local policy, which means it can be changed if we unite and organize. And then we're going to have a social support committee to help all of our struggling black parents. And then we're going to have a finance committee to study how Milwaukee public schools are spending your tax dollars. Show of hands, whoever had a contract with Milwaukee public schools that was worth at least quarter of a million dollars in here? Not one of you. Not one of you. Who got the contract to clean the bathrooms in Milwaukee school? Who got the contract to wash the windows? Who got the contract to bring in the lunch? Who brings in the books? Who brings in the school buses? Who got the after school tutoring contract? Come on, y'all. Millions of money. And this is your, this ain't no grants. This is contracts. That's being paid for with your tax dollars and you ain't getting no cut. Do you realize if you had the bathroom contract for one year, you could put 50 black people to work at least? That's why we got to go to the school board meetings. You join the parent association of Milwaukee, you got to go to the school board meetings. Can't be lazy because having a lazy black parent is like having no black parent at all. And then we're going to have a homeschool committee. For those in Milwaukee who want to homeschool your children, we're going to unite y'all so we can do it together. Have a network! Why well, we got mothers in Milwaukee homeschooling their kids by themselves and working two jobs? You're going to burn out! So we got to put it together. One sister might be the math teacher on Tuesday for all the kids. The brother be the history teacher on Monday for all the kids. Sister going to do agricultural science on Thursday. All the kids! African martial arts, all the kids! And Dr. Umar going to do introduction to white supremacy on Sunday while they mind praying to Jesus Christ. All the kids. All the kids. And then we got to have a parent advocate committee because we need some of y'all to be advocates for the other parents because no parent should ever go to a school meeting alone. No parent should ever go to a school meeting alone. Mothers, I hope you're listening. Fathers, I hope you're listening. Stop going to the school by yourself. Take somebody with you. Why? Because they will intimidate you bully you, manipulate you, lie on you, and forge your name on papers you never signed. I've seen it! Take somebody with you. Black man, I know you're not scared of white folks, but you got to take somebody with you because you ain't scared of white folks. Because that teacher going to tell you your boy needs special ed, and you're going to say, nah, ma'am, I was in special ed. My son ain't going. Well, I really think you need to rethink it. And you're going to say, Miss Lerbanowski, I done told your ass that my son... <laughs> And then she's going to say, well, I really think we... <laughs> and then she's going to say, oh, my God, his eyes dilated, the pupils, his vein popped out, my heart gave out, my legs dropped. And the next thing you know, you're being escorted out in handcuffs. Restraining order. I got fathers who can't even go to the child's home to pick up the report cards to the school to get the report cards. Can't even go to the graduation because the white teacher felt threatened by his presence. Stop going to the school by yourself. Take your aunt, take your cousin. You'll be able to take somebody from the parent association in a minute. Witness protection plan. I don't go by my damn self. They would love to get me on some shit. That's right. Because what they do, black mother, 
They put the black mommy in the room to talk about Raheem. And then they make you sweat it out for 10 minutes in the room with no AC. And then they come in, the whole white army. The principal, vice principal, principal intern, nurse, counselor, social worker, psychologist, reading coach, math coach, dean of students, bathroom cleaner, window washer, lunch man. One black mother, 30 crackers. Am I wrong? And then they say, we heard Dr. Johnson was here at Fresh Start on Sunday. And we respect some of the things he has to say, but he's a bit extreme. And you can't let some radical from Philadelphia tell you how to raise your children. Listen, Miss Lerbanowski taught you as a child. She taught your brothers and sisters. I am so hurt that you would even suggest that we don't like black people. My husband is black, by the way, and I take offense to what... white shit right, right. and y'all start oh I'm sorry Miss Lerbanowski I didn't know you was liberal <laughs> and then when they think they got you what they do secret weapon Queen Mother Kuji Chakalia from the Kwanzaa movement comes in the room you didn't know she she got shea butter veggie wraps incense she's the home and school coordinator and she comes up to you and she said listen to me I'm old enough to be your mother and Dr. Umar. Now, I ain't got all them fancy degrees or none of that, but I'm Queen Mother Kuji Chakali. <laughs> you grew up on my black history program. Listen, he's right. White people are racist, but not all of them. These are good white people. I've been working with them for 30 years. Listen, don't you love me? I'm your queen. I'm your elder. And as your elder, I'm telling you, that your son does need some medicine. It's not that bad. Don't you know my grandson, John John? He was on 10 milligrams of Concerta, 12 milligrams of Adderall, a gallon of Prozac, and ain't nothing wrong with John John. Yeah, they caught him walking butt naked down the street last night, but not because of the medicine. What's the moral of my story, Milwaukee? Don't trust nobody who work for the school district, even if they look like you. Second announcement. We go to Africa for two weeks every summer. We just got back August 8th from Senegal in South Africa. We went to Shaka Zulu's graveside and we went to where they made the Shaka movie, went to the Gory Island slave dungeon and we had a great time. We got African names and my South African name is Nkosi Mobutu. <laughs> that means Legion of Warriors. My Senegalese name is Lot Joa, who was a Senegalese leader who resisted the French and was murdered for fighting against white supremacy. My Nigerian name is Ifa Tunde Oguntade. <laughs> Destiny has returned and Ogun wears the crown. So save up your money, family. The trip is normally about $4,000. Everything is included except a couple meals and you're spending money. I haven't chosen the two countries yet for next summer, but I'm working on it around January. You can start paying on that. So you got the Africa trip for you. You got the college tour for your children. Make sure you donate to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. GoFundMe.com forward slash Dr. Umar. GoFundMe.com forward slash Dr. Umar. I also have donation envelopes back there on the table. You can make a donation today or send it in later. Payable to FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia. So far, we've raised $700,000, and a lot of them checks came from Milwaukee. So I want to say thank you. We're still pushing, and we're still pushing, and we're going to get a school soon. They want me to put the school in Africa. They said, Doc, bring the school to Africa. I want to. I'm a Pan-Africanist. Why not? That's two birds with one stone. They love me over there as much as y'all love me here, but because most of the money did come from here and because most of you ain't thinking about no damn Africa, I want to put the first school here. Also, if you want to work at the school, send me your resume. You can send your resumes to FDMG Resumes, F-D-M-G-R-E-S-U-M-E-S. -E 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 -E
I need math teachers and science teachers and history teachers and language teachers, but I also need security guards. I also need lunchroom staff. I also need sisters who know how to do natural hair because our girls will be nappy by nature. No perm, no weed, no hair color, no extensions. Your daughter must show up natural or not at all. She might have a Caesar like me or she might have a baby Gumby or a baby Afro or twisties or locks, but it's going to be hers. And I'm not knocking my sisters who processed. I love all y'all. All right. But we want our daughters to grow up not feeling inferior to anyone to the point where they feel like they got to look like them. We want them to love themselves as God made them. And if your son goes to a school where all the kids are natural, if your son goes to a school where all the girls are natural, you ain't never got to worry about him coming home with nothing but an African queen. Yes. I need people who know how to grow because we're going to have a farm. Yes. We're going to have a botany clinic. We're going to have our own greenhouse. I need people now to do hydroponics. We're going to raise our own fish. We're going to have a fish fry every week. <laughs> I didn't give up fish, damn it. So send me your resumes. Also, brothers and sisters, every Tuesday, of course, business. We're going to be teaching. Our six sciences are economic science. We're going to teach our children how to do their own taxes by the time they've done the ninth grade. They will be investing in Wall Street by the time they've done the 10th grade. They will have their own business plan by the time they've done the 11th grade. They will have mastered the real estate market of Wisconsin by the time they graduate. Why? Why are we doing economic science? Because getting a college education ain't doing nothing for black folks. But putting them in the debt. I want your son to make his first million dollars by the time he's 21. And he's going to be swagalicious. So all the women, when their daughters get old enough and they need a husband, guess what they're going to bring their daughters? Straight to FDMG. She need a FDMG, man, or none at all. <laughs> also, brothers and sisters, don't forget, every Tuesday morning I have the Free Black Parent Teleconference. That's tomorrow. But I won't be doing it tomorrow because one of my good cousins passed away two days ago, Shanika. She and I were very close. We were born the same week. She was August 14th. I'm August the 21st. We grew up together. And now she's gone.